YouTube, it means you're going to be recorded. Give me a moment, we're going to get this live on Facebook, and then we will be rocking. It's okay. It's a miracle that all planes landed, that we're in Montana, we're in the shul, Randy and Michelle and Seth are here in person. You guys are here in uh, spirit and on Zoom. So give me a moment here. Where are we? Very good. Jewish.tv. While they're making, you know, people are drinking coffee, so we're going to give them a minute to make their coffee. You're not drinking coffee? Why not? Living with you. I drove it. I drove it there. I had major issues, a thousand dollars worth of fixing. Kind of close to problems. I have no idea. What was your problem? Uh, with it. The, uh, I couldn't shaky. remember all those fans. It was definitely shaky. It was something to do that cost seven hundred dollars. I don't know what. These are questions for not for rabbis, right? We wanted to know about carburetors or whatever these things are. We'd go to engineering school or something. I know what happens if a spoon of milk falls into a pot of chicken and how you make sure it's kosher. Okay, we're going live. We are going to... Huh? He's asking me questions about the inside of cars. Rabbis don't know about the insides of cars. We barely... Because you. one of my cars was having issues. I had to take it to Honda to get checked out. So he's asking if I know what they figured out what was wrong. I don't know. I know what the bill was. I don't know what they figured out. Okay, we're going to share this on Facebook. We're going live. Oh, I love hearing myself. Yeah, that's great. We're going to begin. It's a double Torah portion, but we are going to go to the end of the second Torah portion, which is uh, page 974. And you go to LinkedIn, Randy, you'll see, uh, I know you don't check it every day. When you do check it, You'll get the whole story of my airport fiasco in great detail. It's very entertaining. I must say so myself. And I'm here to tell the tale. I read a lot of your stuff. I don't comment. I think I actually... No, I'm saying this was only posted this morning, so... I gave you a heart for something or like something the other day. I got a heart from Randy. I'm going to take it. It's a... Uh, yeah. Okay. We got it, I think, now on all platforms, and we are good to go. And, uh, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Three minutes late, which is very unusual, Chabad of Bozeman, but we uh, were a one-man band as far as the technology. So we got it all done, and we are excited to be back. Last week we did it on Tuesday, which threw a couple of you off, but today we're back on Wednesday. Next Wednesday I should be landing back in Bozeman early in the day from a very, very short trip to Israel. So if everything goes well, and I'm dependent on a lot of things, like six flights, round trip, three there and three back, airlines, weather, uh jet lag whatever but if the plan goes well the next wednesday night you'll have a rabbi that's very very overtired giving a class but we might have a lot of fun because of it uh, page 974 in the chumash and um we're at the end of the double parsha and the jewish people just endured a potential uh rough time being cursed by balaam the non-jewish prophet so let's first demystify the myth Prophets aren't only Jews. Sure, when you're Jewish and you're studying the five books of Moses, you're going to read primarily about the Jewish prophets, but God gifted historically, just like there were Jewish prophets, there were non-Jewish prophets. The most prominent of those non-Jewish prophets, those Gentile prophets, was a guy named Bilaam. In English, they call him Balaam. But Bilaam was a Gentile who was a, a previously, he was an advisor to the Pharaoh in Egypt, along with Jethro and Job, as we read in the Talmud, uh, Seth. And Balaam was a Midianite. He was from the same nation that gave us Jethro, which is Moses' wife, Zipporah, was the daughter of Jethro, who was a minister, a, a minister to the pagan or, or idolatrous beliefs of Midian. Balaam was from the same family, the same tribe, the same region. What made Balaam unique was that he had no beef with the Jews, and he hated us nonetheless. So he was the original anti-Semite. There are some people that hate Jews for a reason. Now, their reasons may be wrong, right? Hatred in general is a wrong philosophy. But if someone hates an entire nation, 
right? If someone tells you, I hate all black people, or I hate all Armenian people, or I hate all Native Americans, something's wrong with them. They obviously either don't understand reality, humanity, or they've been brainwashed in a very negative way. But there are times that people hate other groups because they are trained with something that at least can be logically understood. For example, in this week's Torah portion, there's a king of Moab, his name is Balak. Balak is the one that hires Balaam to curse the Jews, hoping that his divine ability to curse will bring havoc to the Jews. But Balak at least had some logic for it. What was his logic? He had a territorial uh, piece of land near Israel. He was concerned that the Jews would invade and take his land, even though they had no intention to do so. It was paranoia. And everyone looks at Ukraine and Russia and, you know, the, the, the former Soviet Union. They think, oh, my gosh, how much paranoia could someone have to invade a country? <laughs> a lot. Study the Bible and you'll find out what people in power, what kind of level of paranoia they have. So Bullock is one of those people. So it's paranoia. And he's wrong. But at least logically... He had a reason to want to fight the Jews because he was scared, rightfully or wrongfully, but he was scared that they would take his territory. Bilaam had no reason whatsoever to be fearful of the Jews. He had interacted with the Jews before. He was a prophet of God, which means that he knew that the Jews had no intention of taking the Moabite land, but he hated them so much, illogically, irrationally, that he was willing to come and curse the Jews. And even when God told Balaam, that when you go to curse the Jews, you're not going to be able to utter a word that I won't put in your mouth, which means the three times that Balaam tries to curse the Jews, every time he opens his mouth to curse the Jews, he ends up saying incredible, beautiful things about the Jews, the most beautiful prophecies ever said about Jews. Right? If you're ever wondering why sometimes Jews are not so nice about themselves, they talk about fellow Jews pretty miserably, but then you have some nice Christian from Texas or something that speaks about Israel like it's the, you know, like, like it's meant to be, like the promised land, amazing people. Like this, this has biblical origin, that the Jews see themselves, sometimes see their fellow Jews in a negative light. And you have Bilaam who wants to say negative things, and God plants these most poetic, beautiful words about the Jewish people in his mouth and some of the most beautiful prayers that we say till today. Matovu ohalacha Yaakov, how, how, um, Good are your tents, O Israel, your dwelling places, O Jacob. That comes from the words of a non-Jewish, a Gentile prophet. The prophecies, the only biblical prophecy deliberately about the coming of the Messiah, about Mashiach, was prophesied by who? By Balaam, the non-Jewish prophet. So he tries to curse the Jews. He doesn't succeed. He says beautiful things. So he resorts to one last thing he knows how to do to mess with the Jews. And it's really evil. It's evil when someone hates another group of people so bad that they're willing to orchestrate the demise of the enemy, even if it's below the belt. But that's what Bilaam does. And that's what we read about literally at the last section of the second of the double Torah portion. So it says, the Jewish people settled in Shittim. And as a result of Bilaam's plot, the people began to be immoral with Moabite girls. The Moabite invited the Jewish people to the feast that they made to their gods, and the Jewish people ate and prostrated themselves to the Moabite gods. Israel thus became attached to the deity Baal Peor. God became furious with Israel and sent the plague upon them. God said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people to judge those who worship idols and hang them before God in view of the sun so everyone can see. Then God's fury will withdrew, withdraw from Israel. Moses said to the 88,600 judges of Israel, each of you should kill two men who become attached to Baal Peor. And so there's this terrible plague where the Jews, thousands of them, who betrayed their people, even though it was a plot of Bilaam, were killed. Terrible plague. And eventually the plague ends, and the amount of people that end up dying are 24,000 people in the plague. A massive, massive um, punishment. What happened over here? The biblical story is, is, you know, it's one of those stories you won't hear in Hebrew school, maybe rightfully so. Maybe these are one of the stories that actually the Hebrew school teachers should skip, but the details are important. Because what Bilaam did is he went to the king of Moab, Balak, and he said, listen, you're not going to beat the Jews with prophecy, with curses. There's one trick you can get to take the Jews down, and that is get God really, really upset at them. How do you get God really, really upset at the Jews? Get them to be immoral. In God's eyes, there are certain behaviors that are considered totally immoral. I know in today's society, 
you're not allowed to talk about that because everything's all about free love. You can love whatever you want, however you want, you know, whenever you want. It's all good. In Judaism, that's not the case. If you don't like what I just said, that's too bad. That's what the Torah says. And I don't work for the apologetic movements of humanity. I say it the way it is. God has a system of what's okay and what isn't. And for Jews to be cohabitating with Moabite enemies of the Jewish people because they got sucked in by the Moabite women's beauty. And by the end, they not only cohabitated, they not only had a relationship with the Moabite women, but the Moabite women got them to serve their idols. So now you have both idolatry and a form of adultery or uh, promiscuity going on simultaneously. And this was Bullock's, this was Balaam's advice to Bullock all along, which is get them to sin and they will be their own worst enemy. You won't have to do anything. Then God will take care of the rest. And it worked. Now, what's, what's fascinating here is that Jewish people knew what God, right? This is way after the Ten Commandments. It's way after the giving of the Torah. They knew that immorality was wrong. They knew that relationships have a structure in Judaism. But there's human nature. Human nature is that when you are seduced, when there's a seductive behavior presented before you, you are going to be, chances, I shouldn't say you're going to be. Of course, we are meant to, you know, the, one of the most principal teachings in Tanya, in Jewish mysticism, is minds always control our hearts. So in, in, if instituted, if, if we work on it, if we meditate on it, and we create a reality that our mind, right? How do CIA agents do it? You ever wonder? I mean, it's obviously over... It's over-dramatized on, uh, on TV and stuff, but how did these guys do it? How did Mossad agent, how did Ellie, Ellie Cohen sit in, in Damascus for that many years and live a double life and they could torture you and you'll never, right? I always say, if someone stuck a needle in my arm and said, hey, <laughs> who do you work for? I'd tell them in a second. It's not, I was never trained to, to survive under torture. I can survive raising five kids barely, but I'm not, torture is not my thing. Right? I don't want to say like Mr. Macho. You know, if someone put a gun to me and said, bow to an idol, I've been trained that I die. Idols are not an option. I'm a Jew. The, the, the paganism or idolatry is not an option. But regular torture, how do they train people? But Hasidus teaches, Jewish mysticism teaches, that we have the ability of Moev Shaltal, that we have the ability to control our emotions. We're not meant to be instinctive animals. We're meant to control we're supposed to have both intellectual capacity and emotional capacity, but they're supposed to balance each other out. They're supposed to work in unison, not your emotions dictating how you should think. Because when your emotions dictate how you think, you have a country that looks like ours now. Where people, everything is based on emotion. You can't have intellectual conversation because right away they'll scream at you that you're a Nazi or you hate women, you hate men, you hate this, you hate that. They'll scream at you everything. You're a xenophobe, you're a racist. All I was doing was having a conversation. But no one's allowed to have that. But in Hasidus, we are taught, no, our brain is meant to rule supremely over our emotions. You're supposed to have healthy emotions, but guided, right? They call it emotional intelligence for a reason. And we see that realistically here because what they did here is they joined an idol called Baal Pa'or. Not to get too graphic, if you'd like to Google it later, you're welcome to. But the shorter synopsis of what Baal Pa'or mm -hmm. idol was is that they defecated at the center of this idol. So they had this statue of sorts and they would go to the restroom. They would defecate on the idol and that was the way you serve the idol. It was considered some kind of honor to be able to defecate on this statue. Now I know to all of us that have a half a brain, like who would ever do that? And the truth is that all of idolatry really makes no sense to us in today's day and age, right? People, most human beings today have no way of really comprehending old school, old fashioned type of, uh, of idolatry. But I will tell you that if the people that served idols came to our generation, they'd have a lot of questions too about the things that we accept as being normal today, that we even have to have a conversation about certain things which are so, they're, they're so basic and foundational, yet people are discussing whether it is or isn't. So there's a balance there, but the truth is that they were defecating on an idol, claiming this is some kind of religious service. Like now, you know, they had the hogs. In, uh, in Saudi Arabia for the, for the Muslim uh, holiday, they throw rocks. So there is some explanation for why they throw rocks at their statue, at their altar, there's some kind of spiritual significance of atonement, but defecating? Where does that come from? How does a person end up in a place where they can think that that's okay? But before I answer that question, I want to 
talk for a moment about this concept of Moyach Shaltel. Oh, that's so that was the name of sacrifice. So uh, Seth just asked the question, what about when the kids go through fire, when they take their kids and there's different interpretations, whether the kids are actually burnt. It's one of the idols, one of the pagan worships. They would put their kid between fire. Now, one opinion is that the kids were actually burned. They, they would kill their kids. They would sacrifice them, which in Judaism, human sacrifice, as in dying for your faith, is not a, is not a, is not a form of sacrifice unless it's being done to you against your will. But a normal, you know, a person in service of God doesn't kill themselves. But there's other opinions that didn't actually burn their kids, but they put they scared their kids. Either way, that at least you can sort of rationalize and say it's some form of sacrifice for for a guy. It doesn't have to make sense to me and you, but you can understand where they came up with the idea from. But defecating, it's the most right. Most humans are uncomfortable with the whole concept of defecating. No one wants to talk about it. No, you do your thing and you move on. Now you want, you make it into a religion that the Bible's talking about. I want to, for a moment, before I continue about this, I want to just point out on this concept of Mayach Shalat love about the idea that your mind should control your emotions. Um, I mean, this is all about today. It's it's the in thing, at least in my house it is, with Javi. She's very good at this. And, and I have to say, on some level, she's succeeding even with a guy like me, with mindfulness, with the idea of the fact that certain things are out of your control and you just need to surrender to the reality and, and stop getting angry about it because it's not going to change anything. And I actually successfully incorporated that Monday night at the airport and, and for six hours. And it was, it was an amazing thing to watch. I was watching myself almost like, and, and I was like, this is a weird thing. I didn't scream at anyone. I didn't scream at my kids because I was nervous and tired. I didn't freak out. I figured out who do I have on Tuesday that I need to cancel. One of them was you. One of them was my trainer. And we canceled them. Like, okay, we got another night in Michigan. So what? And I was like, this is so cool. I can't imagine people live their whole life like this. They just go with the flow, right? So mindfulness is a very powerful thing, but to take it to an extreme where your instincts never play a role, it's always a deliberate decision, that's that's hard stuff. And there was a chassid named Rav Moshe Meislish, and I apologize if any of you heard this story from me because I have shared it. I don't know how many, not many times, but I've shared it. He was a, a chassid in Russia during the time, in the late 1700s, right? Or, or, yeah late 1700s, when Napoleon and the Russians were at war. And the Alter Rebbe, the founder of the Chabad Hasidic movement, there was a big debate amongst the religious leaders in Russia whose side they should choose in the war. Should they choose the Napoleon side? Because he was offering the Jewish people freedom with less harsh um, circumstances to live in? Or should they choose the Russian side where they would be very harsh physically but they they wouldn't be as much uh, there wouldn't be as much religious freedom which would allow Jews to sort of uh, jump ship and not be religious anymore. And there was a great Reb the Karl, uh, the Karl, the Kalisker who believed that the Napoleon should win. And our the founder of Chabad was a firm believer that the Russians should beat Napoleon because it's a there's, there's a better chance of our success of survival being under Russian duress because at least when we're under duress. We fight for our Judaism because they're trying to take it away versus give them freedom like we saw when the Jews came to America and they, and they drop it all. So the Rush, the Nap Napoleon did not like the Alter Rebbe, the founder of the Chabad movement, and he tried coming for him. He didn't succeed, but he tried. One of his chassid and one of his students was a, a trilingual chassid. His name was Moshe Meislish. Moshe Meislish spoke French. He spoke Russian. He spoke obviously Hebrew, Yiddish, so not trilingual. He was quadlingual. He spoke four or five languages, and he managed to become an informant for. A, a, he was a he was a double agent. He claimed to work for Napoleon, even though really what he was doing was getting information for the Russians via the Alter Rebbe. And they couldn't figure out for the life of them the French, who's getting the information to the Russians. They could only cons they could only. The, you know, the, the only Napoleon's only conclusion was that it's this Russian chassid. So one day, out of the blue, they're in a meeting. Napoleon walks into the room, looks at Moshe Meisel and says, "You're the one." And as he says, "You're the one," he puts his hand on Moshe Meisel's heart to feel his heart rate, and his heart rate didn't budge. So that he was. So Napoleon was certain this is not him. He doesn't know who the guy is. So years later, they asked Moshe Meisel, "How did you control yourself?" To not let you to freak out, Napoleon says, "For how many decades was I trained that Moya in Tanya in, in Jewish mysticism that Moya shall live that your mind needs to control your heart?" This was my moment. 
And this is where I knew that I succeeded in incorporating the idea. Now, I'm not saying that most people could get to that level, right? That's a CIA type level. That's a, you have to train yourself in incredible ways to do that. But the idea that somehow instinctively we should let ourselves get carried away just because it's seductive or just because it's tempting or just because it's attractive, that's not the Jewish way. But Balak understood from Bilam that this is the way to get the Jews. And so what happens here is really fascinating. And what I actually share with you today is from a, you know, in the 1930s and early 1940s, when the Rebbe of Blessed Memory was escaping Europe. Well, first he was in Berlin, going to the University of Berlin, and then later he was in Paris and Vichy and um, Marseille. No, in Nice, and then eventually made it to the United States in 1941. He wrote notes of different Torah ideas, handwritten notes, manuscripts, and only after the Rebbe passed away in 1994, in his desk drawer, the, the, the elder Hasidim, like Rabbi Krinsky, the Rebbe secretary, they found these notes. Like, oh my gosh, there's hundreds and hundreds of pages of Torah information, in addition to everything he had said throughout his... So they took that and they gave it to a team of scribes who wrote it and figured out what it meant. And it was all written in short notes, you know. So one of those written notes, he addresses this issue of how a person could end up in a place where you would defecate and think that somehow that has meaning or that there's some purpose here in this idolatrous way. We're talking about Jews, Jews who watched the exodus from Egypt, the giving of the Torah at Sinai. They experienced the sin of the golden calf and God's forgiveness for that. They, 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 they experienced the story with the spies, convincing them that they shouldn't go to Israel and realizing that they're going to be punished for an additional 39 years in the desert. They, saw, they had manna from heaven. They had miraculous water. Who gets sucked into this kind of crazy stuff? It has to start somewhere. And in this written note, the Rebbe sort of goes through the trajectory of how you end up from here, from manna from heaven and, 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 and clouds of glory, to defecating on an idol. And he says as follows. He writes as follows. When the Jews were in the desert, they had no... They didn't really have much interaction with the physical and material world, right? If your manna comes, your food comes as manna from heaven, you don't work for it. There's no agricultural work. It's just a gift from heaven every morning. And your water comes from a miraculous well associated with Miriam, Moses' sister. And you're surrounded by clouds of glory that protect you from snakes and scorpions and wash your clothing miraculously and uh, iron your clothing. And it, it levels out the, the, the hills and the mount and, and, and the mountains, and, well, not the mountains, but the hills and the desert so that your kids and your animals can walk without too much burden. And you walk through splittings of sea, seas that are splitting. Your interaction with the physical is not really very, very uh, high. Right? You're getting enough food to eat every day. You never have to worry about where you're going to provide. So you keep kind of a very, very healthy distance from physicality and materialism. Now, the Jews are now at the end of the program. They're almost going into the land of Israel. They're now on Transjordan on the east side of the Jordan River. And what we're reading about, this section that we're reading about, is when they're, they'd already started conquering the various nations along the Jordan River, which is why the Moabites were scared in the first place, right? Because they watched Og, the king of Bashan, and the Emirates are being conquered. Like, oh, no, the Jews are coming for us, too. So that means the Jews are now interacting. They're getting closer to the reality in which they're going to need to interact with the physical, with agriculture, where if they want to have a good sandwich with some nice rye bread, they're going to have to plow and water and, and, and plant and do all the physical labor that's needed to create bread. No more manna from heaven, right? That's why the blessing we say it when we eat bread is hamotzi lachamina aretz, who gives forth bread from the earth. When the Jews ate manna in the desert, the, we are told in the Talmud and the Jewish law, they said a blessing, hamotzi lachamina shamayim, who was given bread from heaven. Not from the earth. So now the Jews are moving into an area where nature is suddenly playing a real role. Physicality, oops, sorry, I let someone into class. Physicality, materialism is playing a real role. And what happens then is you start giving a lot of credit to nature. Oh, yeah, listen, I work the land. So nature is a real thing. Nature is incredible. If I don't get enough sunlight and I don't get enough rain, suddenly all these natural things that the Jews didn't have to worry about in the desert because they were pampered and spoiled, now they have to deal with it. And that's why it says, by Yeshem Yisrael Bashitim, which translates here, the, people, the Jewish people settled, it says the Jewish people settled in Shittim, but the word Shittim also comes from the word 
um, to stray. So the Jewish people settled as they get closer to the land of Israel and they start straying because they're starting to give a lot of credence, a lot of respect, a lot of honor to the physical objects that are part of nature that to them now have a real, they're being recognized real strongly. And therefore, what's the next thing you do is that you become sucked in and you become seduced by those natural occurrences. It's a very dangerous thing. Right, look what happens to people when they have a lot of money. Actually, they don't have to have a lot of money. If someone is very poor and they make a few dollars, you ever see what happens to them? It's incredible. They become totally controlled with the few dollars that they made. They think they're, you know, the, 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 they own the world now because they made a few thousand, you know, if, if, depending on where you're going from, right? If a millionaire becomes a billionaire, they take on a whole new level of arrogance, a whole new level of the money is so important. So now take money out of the picture and just Look at agriculture. If you're a farmer, now all your sustenance is coming from the ground. You're going to, and you're working it and you're investing in it and you're giving it so much credit, the sun, the rain, the this, the that. And okay, the dirt, you know, what kind of soil, topsoil, this soil, that soil. So now you're so, you're being seduced by the, by the nature, by the natural occurrences. You're being seduced by physicality. And what happens next? You now become immersed in physicality to the point that you you're not even you don't even know why you're so obsessed with the physical but you're just obsessed with the materialism right if you ever ask someone who has, that has let's say someone has a bill, uh, five billion dollars I, I don't know i never met you ask him why aren't you retired like why do you still go to work in the morning or if you're going to work why do you have to go to work to make money maybe go to work at a food bank or something you have five billion dollars you can buy three provinces in canada and no one would even care I just picked on Canada because it's, I could pick on the Dakotas for the same price. But I mean, if you bought, I don't know, the Yukon, who would care? Right? What does that play? Yellowtail or something? Who? Yellow knife. Yellow knife. Uh, Yellowtail is the fish, I think. <laughs> Yellow knife, right? Tavi and I were looking once at a map. Ooh, we should go to Yellow knife. Well, how seven planes till I get there, right? But who would care? You have $5 billion. What are you going to, what are you, what are you trying to make more for? But when you become so upset, oh, no, yeah. Um, when you become so obsessed with physicality, you become so obsessed with physicality that it, that becomes the purpose. There's no following purpose. It's not, I need to make money so I can give charity. I need to make money to feed my family. I need to make money to help the village. No, I need to make money to make money because now I'm obsessed with making money. I don't even know what I'm going to do with them. And the Jews had a similar, you know, similar thing transpire for them with their obsession with agriculture. Oh my gosh. Agriculture is so cool. I need more of it, and I give it so much credit, and it's so important. And what happens then is you end up wanting to be involved in physical matters and materialistic matters, even without a purpose. And that's why they were easily seduced into cohabitating with Gentile women. Why? In Jewish law, if a Jewish man marries a non Jewish woman, which is prohibited in Jewish law, but it happens all the time, if a Jewish man um, um, uh, marries a non-Jewish woman and they have a child, according to Jewish law, according to halacha, not according to biology, not according to bloodline, and not according to American law. According to halacha, the child belongs to the mother, not to the father. The father and the child have no halachic, meaning from a Jewish law perspective, there's no bond between them. So, of course, it's, bi it's biological. It's their kid. And, of course, there's a bloodline there, but halachically, from a Jewish law perspective, they are not father and son. So then why would a Jewish man go and cohabit, co cohabitate with a Moabite woman knowing that if they have a child, it wouldn't even be his? What's the answer? They didn't care about having a child or not. That wasn't the purpose. Even though the whole concept of cohabitating is about procreation, it wasn't about that to them. It was simply like when, when you get to a place in your life where physical and material pleasures are just about physical and material pleasures and more and more and more of the same, Few with few, you know, with to futile endeavor, meaning there's no other purpose other than the actual enjoyment. Then you end up doing things which make no sense because there is no end game. It's just about the temporary pleasure. You ever wonder why? I was talking to my sister this morning about a person we both know who ruined his entire career and almost ruined his entire marriage because of a, you know, he couldn't control himself in his relationships. And it's literally how a choice a person makes one hour of one day of their life can change the trajectory of their entire life. 
you think about it, it's mind blowing. How much can you allow your emotions to control your, your brain that you would, now I get it. There's something called addiction and there's things called temptation. I got that. I'm not in La La Land, but one hour, one, one hour of your life that will change the entire trajectory of your life. But that's what happens when you, when you are trained or you train yourself to believe that there is a purpose in the physical material enjoyment in itself without anything good coming out of it for the greater good or for the greater or for humanity as a whole. There is no bigger paupers that I know in my life like, than people that have millions and millions of dollars and they don't know how to give it and share with the rest of the world. You meet such people and I do in my job, it just happens to be. And you've never met more sad human beings in your life because they don't care how much money they have in the bank. They're not happy people. You can't be if you're just immersed in physical and material temptation without any greater purpose. It's just a fact. And so the reality is, is that what happened to the Jews here is they went from state of spiritual ecstasy in the desert, no physicality or materialism, to a state of Oh my gosh, we're in, and we're interacting with the physical world. There's so much amazing things. Nature is awesome. Physical beauty is amazing. Materialism rocks. Now I just want to have it for the heck of it. Forget about procreation. Forget about right feeding myself. Imagine if people, myself included, on this one. Imagine if we only ate when we were hungry. I'd be the size of a toothpick right now if I only ate when I was hungry. I eat when I'm nervous. I eat when I'm happy. It doesn't matter what the emotion is, but the emotion, what do they call it? Eating your emotions. I'm very good at that. Should have seen me in Detroit. Unfortunately, they don't have kosher food in the airport, so it minimized my temptations. But, you know, the reality is we sometimes delve and immerse ourselves into physical and materialistic stuff without any other purpose other than self-indulgence. And once in a while, self-indulging is not the end of the world. Somehow it releases the energy and it allows you to become a better human being, right? Go fly fishing, go do something in nature, even if you don't have some big world transformation uh, uh, goals. But the idea of spending a lifetime or a week or a month doing nothing other than indulgence is not the way a human being can ever live functionally and can ever be a proper asset to humanity unless you want to end up like these guys who end up cohabitating with a bunch of women with no goals whatsoever. Because even if they did have a child, it wouldn't be theirs. It was just for the pleasure. Instant gratification was the source of all of it. And that is the number one downfall of the human condition. I've shared... I don't know how long ago, but when I was in yeshiva in Tzfat in uh, 2001, I think it was, it was 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, we were sitting at a fabring in a Hasidic gathering in some decrepit building in Tzfat. I still, I'm still surprised the building hasn't fallen off the cliff yet. It always felt like it was into the wadi. Um, but this Rabbi O, his name was Rabbi Ormland, big guy, teddy size, shows up, big dude. He walks in the middle of the night and sits down. Rabbi O was an American guy. He wasn't an Israeli he, he spoke our language. And we went, what, what do you got to say, Rabbi O? He says, listen, guys, we were all like 20 years old. He says, you're just starting your life. And you're going to find out that there's the black box of humanity, just like a plane has a black box. There's a black box in every heart. What do you think you're going to find when they check your black box to find out why you crashed, why you fell, why you had your spiritual downfall? Or maybe sometimes even your mental or emotional downfall. Because if you check the human black box, the number one reason for crashes, when the NTSB comes to check the human black box, you're going to find it's called instant gratification. We want everything and we want it now, right? Like the New York prayer for serenity. God, give me patience and give it to me now. Mm -hmm. Something to that effect. And because of instant gratification, we don't look at the bigger picture. We don't look at what it may create for us down the road. We get so sucked in into the moment that we just do it. It's exactly, I mean, this obviously was in a more extreme case, but this is what happened here. And it's interesting because it would make sense if the Jews, while committing adultery and promiscuity, would also say, you know what, let's serve the moon. Let's serve the sun, like the sun god, the moon god, like the Romans did, like the Greeks did. Why? Because at least they gave it reason. I'm going to service the sun, even though they were wrong, but at least their logic was the sun gave me sunlight, so let me worship the sun. They were totally wrong because the sun and the moon are, are operated by God. Not They're not independent entities. They don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I'm going to shine or not. Right? The Rambam Maimonides writes in the 12th century that that was the original mistake of idolatry and paganism was that they thought that the sun and the moon operated independently. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about people who didn't feel like they get anything from the idol. 
right? The Baal Pa'or was a statue, right? It had no physical powers, wasn't giving them anything to benefit them, and yet, what did they do? They defecate on it. What does defecate? What, when you defecate, what happens? It's waste. There's a reason why it's called waste. There's nothing there. And it's a reminder that there are people that live life without any structure, without any substance, without any meaning. There's nothing there other than waste. They look back at their day. They look back at their week. They look back at their life and they say, what have I done to productively, meaningfully live life and bring light and blessing and goodness and and charity to the world? What have I done to bring love to my community, to make people get along, to make people see that there's more to life than just gossiping? Or just politics. Who cares about the stupid politics? So the Baal Pa'or was not, it wasn't, how they got there is not so novel. Because if you look at the, if you study the history of how they got there, you'll realize that it actually has a perfect trajectory. When you live a life that's all about immersion in physicality and materialism with no purpose whatsoever, you end up living a life, you end up creating your own destiny of a life that has no meaning. You, right, right, Manus Friedman always says, there's living and then there's existing. There's a lot of people who exist, they inhale a lot of oxygen. What do they give the world? They're not living. They're addicting. They're immersing in physical pleasures. And we live today, and it's not just today, I mean, the 60s had their period, every period has their, where we're told, just enjoy, right? What's that famous American song? Be happy and merry for tomorrow you die, something like that. Uh, what is that? No, uh, whatever. It, 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 something like that. It's, it's, it's some, it's, it actually originates with King Solomon, right? He says, don't be like those people who think that I'm just going to live and be merry because tomorrow you die. You're silly. It's a silly way to live your life, but unfortunately, don't worry about it. And unfortunately, there's way too many people that live their life that way. And the way to tr- go back, if we want to go backwards and say, how do we don't how how do we ensure that we don't end up there? As we ask ourselves, number one, are, is our mind controlling our heart? And number two, how much power are we giving the physical and material items in our life? Instead of celebrating the gift that God gives us in nature, seeing how incredible it is, especially here. Last night, when I was landing in Bozeman, it was, uh, it was at uh, 7 o'clock when that big storm came through. We were coming over Trail Creek and a little over Jackson Creek, and I could look south, and I saw a lightning show that normally I do not, I prefer not seeing while I'm in the air. It was all on the, uh, towards Triple Tree, like on the south side of town. And I wasn't nervous. Actually, at that point, I said to the woman next to me, I actually don't mind if he crash lands the plane outside my house. As long as I get down to the ground, I'm cool with it. It's been, it was such a long day of travel. I was like, just get me home. However, a thunderstorm, no thunderstorm, right? But the point is you look at nature and I don't look at a thunderstorm and go, oh, this must be climate change or oh, this must be the, the you know, whatever the meteorological. I look at the thunderstorm and go, look how awesome God is. If he decides sun, sun, he decides Rain, snow, lightning, uh, uh, hail, water. It doesn't matter. God runs this incredible operation. That keeps us humble to realize that we don't have control. But when we get arrogant and we start thinking that these things are important, I could change this and I could change that and I could do this and I can give this credit and that credit. And my bank account, right? All the people that had their money in those California banks who thought they owned the world and boom, overnight, we don't know if the bank was going to survive. And if it wasn't for the government's intervention, it wouldn't. Where's the humility to say, hold on, why am I wasting so much of my life on futility, on meaningless objectives? So let's not make the same mistake of the people, the Jewish people in the days of the Moabites and the days of the Midianites and the days right before they were going into the land of Israel. Let's be the Jewish people who make smarter decisions, live life meaningfully. And to live life meaningfully doesn't cost you any more money, doesn't cost you any more um, heartache, quite the contrary. The more mindfulness you have, the more godliness you have, the more calm you have, the more tranquility you have, the less you are concerned about keeping up with the Joneses or the Goldbergs or whoever you want to keep up with. It doesn't matter anymore because it's not what it's about. That's right. Many wants me to get a Tesla. A whole day is busy with a Tesla something truck. I forgot what it's called already. I said, listen, one day many Hashem should give you enough f- funds. You should figure out how to get your Tesla truck, but it ain't going to happen with me. I'm happy with a Honda. 
I was happy with the Subaru. I'm happy. Is it cozy to drive in a Tesla? I'm sure. I was in an Uber once. It was a Tesla. It was very cozy. But is it worth $100,000 to me? It isn't. You know how many people could be helped with $100,000? You know how many family outings I could do with my family together as a family and enjoy that family time, which is so much more meaningful than if I cocked the car? It's a mindset shift of realizing we don't want to be caught up in the idolatry of physicality, materialism, wealth, and obsession with everything that doesn't matter in life and instead remain obsessed with the inner calm and the inner blessing that comes from being in a relationship with Almighty God. Have a wonderful rest of the week. Um, I will not know until Wednesday afternoon if I am capable of producing a class next week or even sitting in front of a camera. Um, so you'll have to be, you'll have to wait with suspense until Wednesday afternoon. If you get an email, that means there's class. And then not, it means either I'm, I'm parked in an airport somewhere where I didn't plan to be, or I crashed and I'm not available for human interactions. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you back here soon. Zai gesund, and we are checking out. Eat, drink, and eat. be merry for tomorrow. There you go. Okay.